My thing is, if you believe my work says I deserve a certain job, mm -hmm. give me that job. You know what I mean? Like big organizations that are like, we're about the, the... I'm so sorry. I said I'm sorry. I, I can't but apologize. Like, God, Lee, <laughs> you've been coughing yeah, and... You been coughing all the time. Hey. <laughs> Somebody got us up. You don't have, like, some of that foreign tea that's supposed to fix that? I've got tea. I know you ain't got honey. regular tea. Maybe them honey. chaps is too tight. That's some yeah. Ted. That's some <laughs> Ted Lasso. Hey, over there looking like Annie Oakley. That is some Ted Lasso tea, I don't tea, even dog. know who Annie Oakley is. Goodness. Oh, dang. Gracious. Oh, you thought I was done? Oh my God. What's up, everybody? Uh, new edition of Kicking It. Uh, we got a special guest today, um, Super Bowl winner, Emmy Award winner, new contract having Ryan Clark. Good to have you with us. <laughs> it's good to be here. You know, um, I didn't really sign up for a workout. You know what I'm saying? Like, I didn't know, like, how grand of a production kicking it actually was, uh -huh. right? So I didn't know we was gonna have to do like the preview joints, the trailer. I was gonna have to keep walking up this steep hill. Do you wanna and, maybe and, put a post about it out on social and say um, that we're at an impasse and you don't know if you wanna continue with us, but we can talk about it? I mean, sometimes you come to an impasse and you gotta let the world know. <laughs> and I think that, uh, you know, that junk worked out well for me, actually, in the moment. It was a little sticky, but I, I appreciate you guys having me, though. We're excited to have uh -huh. you here. Have you celebrated the new contract? No. I mean... Why not? I don't know. I mean, it depends on how you see it, right? Like, you guys have been in negotiations before. There's never been a great negotiation where one of the sides walk away completely happy. Like, that's not how it works. So who was less happy this time? I don't know. They should be happy because I still work there. Amen. Right? And so, like, that's the... So that's the truth. So like, you blessed them I'm is what you're there. saying? Nah, we... I think... You know, like, I respect, like, everything that is ESPN. Like, to be truthful, you know, like, there's no, there's no network or there's no channel that you can walk past every sports bar or when you're in the airport and you're somewhere, mm -hmm. you see one of those shows on TV. Like, you might, you might not hear it, right. but you see it. You know what I'm saying? Like, that visibility that it allows you, that platform, like, that's powerful. And now my job is, okay, on this platform, who do you become? And it's every day for me, it's becoming more and more who I am, right? Which is the difficult part about that is you allow people to reject that. And so kind of once you get over the fear of people rejecting your authenticity, I think that's like when you can really shine. And it's for sure when I started to grow. So I think the contract negotiations were great because I did my own deal. And they gave you the bag. You know, well, that always is, that's, but that's <laughs> but, part of it. But though. do you think it's crazy, though, that, that it's public knowledge, like talking about numbers and stuff? Yeah, I think, I mean, I think it, it gets leaked because people talk. Most of the time when ESPN does a deal, those deals are done before the contract expires. Right. The only leverage you have is, like, it's, being it's, willing to walk away. Yeah. Right? Being willing to say, like, I'm cool on y'all. Um, and I think the other piece of it is, too, like, be real. You know what I'm saying? Like, you guys have played sports. You've been in TV. Like, you can only do things you can afford to do based on how talented you are. You know what I'm saying? Like, you got to be aware of who you are and who you aren't. Do you think it affects your reputation in any way? Because to me, it felt very, like outside of the norm in the broadcaster realm. Like, it's just not the done thing, right? To come out on social and kind of, it was either super ballsy or kind of risky. Only by people who already don't like me. Okay. So what the hell I care what they say for? <laughs> right, like, okay. honestly, the thing with it was, right, like, I'm a dad first, right? I'm gonna be at all my son's game, I don't care. Most times, I would catch red eyes to New York. So I'd watch my, I'd watch my son play, I'd get on the red eye. I worked in New York at 8 o'clock on Get Up, and at this time, they would fly me to D.C., and I'd do SV Sean, uh, Scott Van Pelt after the Monday night game. So my Mondays started in New York, ended in D.C., and they started, my meeting was at 6 a.m., and I'd usually get to my room like 2 a.m. in D.C., and then I'd fly to Connecticut the next morning. And so Jay Harris was sort of like, hey, man, like, you should, you should just chronicle, like, your travels and your work days and stuff like that. 
And I have a rule, though. Like, I don't take selfies and I don't do selfie videos. I think that's weird for men. Charlie don't have that rule. Yeah, I think, I just, <laughs> yeah, I just think that's weird for men to take... He all the way turned up on that. Yeah, like, uh, you know yeah. what I mean? Like, I just don't... Cause I don't Charlie, like, what do yeah, you do, weird. bro? Like, tell me the... Explain to me the thought process, Charlie. One, yeah. you can cross your legs in the manner that I can't, so I already know you're more sophisticated than I am, right? I, my hips don't work that way. Right, so tell me the thought process <laughs> when you're like sitting in your house, you're chilling, and you go, you know what? Oh, damn. I look really handsome today. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna take a selfie. You worried you don't look handsome, Ryan? No, I've never had that concern. He lives in okay. the moment. You live in the moment. I just, you wanna see how you age too? Like real close up? Yeah, I mean, I know, I know how I've aged though. Like, well, up, well, I just think turning the phone around and taking a picture of my face is strange. No, I will say this, bro. In my phone, if you go there, there are some selfies because I've gotten some haircuts that I've been very fond of. <laughs> and now, will they ever see, like, the light of day? Like, will people ever know I've taken them? Hell no. Hell no. <laughs>
I think people just have to be honest about who their kids are, right? So my daughter won the triple jump state championship in high school, my oldest. Uh, she's the captain of her soccer team. And like, I tried to work out with her one time. She didn't love it. And I said, that's fine. I'm gonna come there, I'm gonna sit in the stands, I'm gonna enjoy it. You go do what makes you comfortable. But I also knew that she had over 30 on her ACT. She was a 4.0 student and like her way was gonna be education. Mm -hmm. That was her, like I knew that. And she was really, she's a really good high school player, but I knew it wasn't gonna go further than that. So I didn't have to, like I didn't have to pour into that that way. And she didn't necessarily want me to, so I let her be. Uh, my youngest played volleyball. She wasn't very tall, so I was like, well, this is gonna be a high school sport, and I'm gonna support you. And then she gets to her senior year, and she's like, Dad, I don't wanna play anymore. Fine with me, right? Like, I'm comfortable with that. My son was different. In the eighth grade, we're driving down the street, and he looks at me, and he's like, Dad, I wanna play a college sport. I said, all right, what sport you wanna play? At the time, he's playing soccer, basketball, football. And so he kind of goes through him. I was like, you're not gonna be very tall, bro. Right, so it ain't gonna be basketball. I was like, so um, we talked about soccer. He's like, I don't really love it like that. I said, it's cool, which was his best sport, right? But I also, like I would've studied and tried to learn and put him in a place to get to where he wants. Like you say, mm -hmm. your son wants to be professional, but I don't know that sport that yeah. way. And then he's like, well, I wanna play football in college. And then from that point on, man, I said, I know what it takes to get what you want. There were mornings, bro, like my son, during the week, would wake up at five o'clock and go train I own a facility, right? And his mom would like be upset with me, like his friends aren't doing that. And I'd be like, I'm not their friend's father. I'm not his friend's father, yeah. right? His friend's father ain't been where I've been either, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? And they may not have had the conversation that they want, that those kids want to be what he wants to be. I know how to get there. And there were mornings, man, that he would cry and he'd be pissed off with me. And every morning I would end it the same way. I was like, you could do one of two things and I'll leave you alone. You yeah. can quit. Right? Or you can tell me that you don't truly want what you told me that day in the car. Yeah. Because if you tell me that, I will go to the games, I'll shut my mouth, I won't say a word, you won't have to train, yeah. and you could just be like any other kid in the world. What that did for him was, it was never dad's making me do this, it's I'm deciding to do this because that's what I want. I would always put it back on what he wants. You mentioned two kids so far now who play soccer, right? The son that you were talking about mm -hmm. and, and the first daughter that you spoke yeah. about. So you've been a soccer dad to some extent. Right. They all tried. My youngest only played for the orange slices, though. So we <laughs> could, uh, the Capri Sun. Yeah, so we couldn't, we couldn't get her to come back out after halftime. <laughs> and she also felt that she could play with an umbrella. Huh? Yeah, because she, she said it was because it was hot. Right. And she felt like she would be more effective if she, she could play cool. with the umbrella, because then she'd have <laughs> shade. It was around that time that I started telling her, baby, you know, you should work on some of the things that are going to help you exceed in life outside of sport. Because <laughs> I knew that that wasn't for her. Was it weird for you to be involved in your kid's sport in a sport, though, that you feel is kind of like, I'm assuming soccer is like out of your comfort zone, right? Like it's better. Why? Oh, it's miserable knowing. Uh. Like, I could, like, him watching his son play soccer, I bet he's so miserable. I am miserable. Oh, it's... Why? I, I don't just because you, you have these expectations of, like, what you talked about and how are you performing, what the team is doing wrong, what he needs to do better, things that he did great. Thing, you know what I mean? It's just you know a lot about what it takes to get to a certain level, and at the same time, you're watching and seeing the things that you need to talk about after the game that's gonna help him improve to, to get to that next level. Whereas like, they're doing something different. It's like, what you're talking about is like, you can do anything, but like, I can help you more in this space, but if you wanna do something else, it's like, ign the ign off you. ignorance is bliss. <laughs> yes. you know, so doing, bliss! If, if you're doing dance, I don't know, let's leave what's up. <laughs> I can't dance that good. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> Are you doing theater? I can't sing or act, but then, hey, I'm gonna sit here and watch, eating some popcorn, like, it's all about, what they want to do, but if you're so like involved and so in, and you know what level they want to get to, it's almost like you feel that that pressure for them as well. Like, like the, it's really high highs and really low lows. You know what I mean? And when they score those goals, you like tear up. But like when things are not going good and, and they're on the bench, you're just like, damn, man, you, you're feeling it for them because you know it's a grind. But did, hey, did it's you try and goes. get involved in any way? Did you try and coach? Did you try? Yeah. So like, I I've coached soccer teams. You've coached soccer teams? Yeah. Like. We just all effort. What was your formation? 
I didn't have no formation. It was little kids. <laughs> <laughs> Coach also, Clark. Like, also too. And so? also too, you gotta realize like. My son is super athletic, really quick. So like at the young ages when they would allow me to coach, right? When it was just like, we just need a dad to coach, mm -hmm. you know? And this was like, I was younger in the league, probably like year four or five. And I signed up to be the assistant coach because I'm a great morale guy. Right. You know, like I get the people going, you know? And so <laughs> then like, they didn't have enough head coaches sign up. So they were like, hey, like you want to coach? And I was like, sure. I mean, I just coach like every other dad. You know, like, I just want to see the kids have a great time. And, like, the, the parents loved me because, because I played at such a high level in my sport, I understood these were just babies, mm. right? I was like, go run around. I was like, I saw your dad. He's 5'2". He's as wide as he is tall. You're going to be an accountant, <laughs> right? Like, we're, <laughs> we're not going to pressure you in any way to score goals, son. You go have a great time. You're not one of them parents on the sideline with the referee up in their face? No. Like, my dad would get kicked out of games a lot, and so I had, like, this aversion to it. I was like, I don't okay. ever want to get kicked out of the game. Um, I am not opposed to offering people fades. In America, that means I'm not opposed to telling people if they continue a certain behavior, they are more than welcome to fight me. <laughs> right? Uh, other than, like, just being very protective of my children as people, like, I try to stay as quiet as possible. Like, because he knows, like, his voice at a soccer game for his son is different than every voice mm -hmm. in, in the building, every voice in the stadium because of who he is and what he's accomplished. you can tell certain things about you, right? One is which, that you're very real. A and the other one is that you're also very conscious of how you present the community that you're representing, mm -hmm. the stereotypes that people will approach you with. And I think that's something that you kind of, is always super impressive in your broadcasting career, is that you have managed to kind of appeal across a, a broad spectrum, right? So you can fit into that mainstream media like an ESPN or other outlets like that, but you can also be your very real and authentic self on a self-owned property, right? And, and you do all of that, it seems, without code switching. Has that been something that's like very conscious for you? No, I think, I think you can only be who you are. It's the easiest thing to do. It's yeah. hard to keep no, up something No, but it's not clear, though. Uh, oftentimes, it's not, because you will feel that pressure that if I want to succeed in this format, I have to fit. I have to act. Right? I mean, I can't speak for you, but when you think about from your playing days, you ha there's a little bit of adaptation, but you're going to play how you're going to play, because it's the way, way you love the game, right? You're going to adapt to what the coach is saying. But, at the, but, e but even in this side, right, like, I'm going to take on board, like, all right, some helpful hints in terms of how to do a, a, a better job uh, in, in the media side. But I'm only going to be myself and use my vocabulary. You're different. You have a different status. You come into this with a status that allows you to have that approach, that it doesn't allow. I, is that fair, Charlie? Yeah. That not everybody across the board can feel that, hey, take it or leave yeah. it. This is who I am. You're considered but, one of the greatest players of but, all time as an American. Yeah, that's so true. So you have a different threshold than, let's say, someone who's never played on the national team. I understand what y'all are saying. And, but, but at the same time, it's like what made me good, but also be my detriment is like, even if I didn't become that, I would act the same. In, in, in terms of, I'm just gonna be me, and it, it's either gonna work out or not gonna work out. You know what I mean? That was my mentality. It's like, I would rather fail <clears throat> being me than to succeed Amen. being something that I'm different. I'd rather do something else. Yeah, but that's not, that's, that's not everybody. I'm not, I mean, I, I think that's you. the. I, you. I think that, like, of, of you. everything you said, I think that's the thing that uh, resonates most with me from this point, it's not necessarily about like what I need to do to succeed at the job as an analyst or as a host, a host, right? It's about what I need to do to succeed at the job and maintain my foundational beliefs, right? Like I think, like what happens, what happens to people in TV is sometimes you have to become a character or mm -hmm. caricature. Right? I never wanted to do that. And 
when you talk about things to your detriment, there are a lot of things that I believe hold me back from certain situations. And I think a big thing about that is relationships. Like, I don't want friends, right? Like, I don't want the executives to be my friends, right? Because I understand in the end, those executives want to do business. Like, I ain't going to lunch with you. I'm not kicking. And like, my thing is, if you believe my work says I deserve a certain job, mm -hmm. give me that job. You know what I mean? Like big organizations that are like, I'm sorry. we're about the, the... I'm so sorry. I said I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I can't but apologize. Like, God, Lee, <laughs> you've been coughing yeah, and yeah, cough the whole time. <laughs> Somebody got us up. You don't have like some of that foreign tea that's supposed to fix that? I've got tea. I know you ain't got honey. regular tea. tea Maybe them honey. chaps is too tight. That's some Ted. Yeah. That's some <laughs> Ted Lasso. <laughs> hey, over there looking like Annie Oakley. That is some Ted Lasso <laughs> tea now. I don't even know who Annie Oakley is. Goodness oh, dang. gracious. But, you know, so, like, the thing that's always played to me is, like, I'm not going to, like, I'm not going to sell my soul for this, right? And I think what she points to with, with code switching is being, analyzing sports now has crossed the line of it just being sports, whether it be the Colin Kaepernick protest or the way that the president at that time reacted to it you now had to be bigger than sports. You go back to 2020 and the athlete involvement and all of those civil rights movements, it was, okay, like, we felt like we were back in the 60s, and now it wasn't just political, because when you think about, like, our community, right, and our culture, it's, like, we don't have the legislation. We don't own the rules and the regulations. We're not in every house in Congress. Like, we don't, we don't get to make those decisions. Like, our stars, right, our voices are athletes because nobody's bigger than LeBron here, right? Nobody's bigger than the starting quarterback of the Kansas City Chiefs, Patrick Mahomes, right? When he was part of a video, when he was like, nah, this needs to stop, that's when the NFL kicked in. And so, in turn, it made us big voices because... People wanted to hear what we had to say about a sport that we played and people's involvement, right, in equality. And so, like, the story I point to the most was when Colin Kaepernick began his protest, there were shows I was left out of. There were... Why? Because they knew what I was going to say. And what I was going to say wasn't good for the network. And looking back, wasn't good for me at the time, right? Like, if you... you they would ask me a question, if the president said a certain thing and they'd ask me how I felt about it, right? If he called the guys that were protesting sons of bees or whatever it is, mm -hmm. they would ask me how I feel and I would tell the truth in the production meeting. And then they would say, are you gonna say that on TV? Mm -hmm. And I would say, you know me, duh. And then they would say, well, we're not gonna ask you. Yeah, we're gonna, we're gonna push you out, out of right. the second. Which, <laughs> which at the time you got a decision to make, right? It's do I change my stance for TV in order to get more TV time, right? Do I want to be left out of these conversations? Which, at the time, of course, I didn't want to be left out, but I wanted to be left out if I had to be something different than who I right. was. Mm -hmm. Now, fast forward to 2020, when the perception and the perspective on that changes. Now, there are days where I'm not even working, where you're asking me to call in, because my voice ain't changed from four years ago, but now it's a voice you need. Ooh. Right now, every time I'm on TV and we're having that conversation, producers are calling me after, my boss is calling me after, like, that was amazing, man, we needed that. Yeah, you needed it three or four years ago, too, but you were scared, Yeah. right? Mm -hmm. But also, there were people at that time at my network who lost their job voicing that opinion. Yep. So in turn, it helped me, mm -hmm. right? And, like, that was a... That's probably one of the things I'm most proud about in TV, was just like, I never switched up who I was. But I think, you know, you, you would face that more in TV to me than I think I would, is Why? because like, you're sort of like a conundrum of a lot of things. You know what I mean? Like you're not, you're not American. I am British. You are British. Right. Right? But Does not get are... that confused? I'm sorry. Oh, you have an American accent. <laughs> I don't. She, see, that, that's where she switched. On this show, they say she, she changes to the American <laughs> accent. As soon as she gets to the Champions League desk, it's like, oh, 
All right. <laughs> it might be her surroundings, <laughs> right? It might be her location. She like her phone. Like, if her location change, it also changes. Yeah. You know, but, like, I think, you know, you talk about, like, how I could have been seen from a perception standpoint because of the videos of leaving mm -hmm. ESPN or whatever it is. And straight up, like, all of the, all of the people or all of the negativity that was written about me, wanting more money, saying, you know, I would love to work less and make more money, like all of these things, which are just common things in life, right? Every negative thing written or said, the people saying it or writing it didn't look like me, wasn't where I'm from. Mm. Cool. We're in a place now, don't get me wrong, like I gotta be great in the X's and O's because that's the pressure that's on me. I'm not a Hall of Famer. Right, I didn't play a glamour position in playing safety. And so I gotta know my stuff, right? But people connect to the actual person. Yes. Right, like you could be the greatest analyst in the world and be boring as hell and nobody 100%. Care. Right. Right, you, mm -hmm. so they want, like now, we're in a space where like people want to know you, which is the scary part because it's like, oh, that means people can reject me too. Yes. They also can personal. reject you when you're a player. No, film don't lie. But, but you know what I'm saying? And, and film don't lie on TV, because you're prepared, you're ready, you go in, you have uh, rebuttals for what people are saying to you, you can have a debate, you know what I'm saying? But Clint, this is, the, this, this is, this is what's different though, right? Okay. Yeah, you can have a debate, but if you are staunchly on the side that it was okay to kneel on George Floyd's neck, you're not gonna like me. Okay. You're not, because the person I am said that was wrong. You see what I'm saying? Yeah, like, I see like, what you're like saying. that's the difference. Mm -hmm. It's hard to be extremely popular, extremely successful in this job if you don't open up pieces of who you are as a human. I want to get into RC the player on the on the field because I grew up a Patriots fan. Football was my Tom number used to one. Beat the off Fo football was my number one sport growing up. Because that's what I was inter introduced to first. I grew up in New Hampshire. I always admired you as a player, the way that you carried yourself. As a, as a safety, it always felt like whoever was coming down that down that field was about to take a hit from you, regardless. And they knew it. They could anticipate it. So people were dropping balls all the time because they were already looking at you before. It helped me a lot. Yeah. So were you somebody who like talked a lot of trash when you played? Were no, you? I ain't say nothing. I was tired as hell out there, bro. Um, nah, I think like I've just always played. I played football since I was four, right? And like toughness was a non-negotiable in my house, right? Like you were going to be tough. Like you were going to play the game hard. Um, I think what happened to me in the league was like I had to find a way to stay there. You know what I mean? Like, I wasn't the fastest, I wasn't the biggest. I was, I was probably, I've never been, I've never been on a team where I wasn't considered the smartest human on the team. I've never been on a team where I wasn't. Um, Nick Saban says it, you know, like, it's the way I made the team in Washington in New York, in Pittsburgh, like that was my job. I'm gonna line everybody up, I'm gonna tell everybody where to go, I'm gonna tell everybody what's coming, and I'm gonna always give us another blade of grass to defend. It's like anything else, right? Like, you have to, to know who you are, know how you could provide worth. Another way I could provide worth was, like, I actually cared about myself less than I cared about other people, right? Like, if I hit somebody and I went to sleep, like, it's actually painless. When you get knocked out, you don't even know it. You know, you go to sleep, you wake up, and it's a new day, right? And so, like, I didn't care about that. But no, like, it's the first thing I ever loved. You know what I mean? Like, the only, true story, and it's sad, probably. Like, the only thing I was able to love easier and more instantly than football was my children, right? Because, like, it didn't matter what football did for me, didn't do for me. It was like, I was always gonna be the same to it. You can't say like, you can't say that about many things in life or many people, right? Like it, did, it didn't, like it didn't owe me anything. And because I understood that, it was okay when I wasn't drafted. You know what I'm saying? It was okay 
when I wasn't cut because I wasn't doing it for the reciprocation of love. I was doing it because that's all I ever wanted to do. And so that also made me like willing to do anything to have it and also the type of person that showed my gratitude in the way I approached it. And I think like that purity of love for it is things that like allowed a, you know, I was 185 pounds, undrafted free safety that played 13 years, won a Super Bowl, became a pro bowler and a team captain because of my approach to football, not because of my talent. You said you were a student of the game. So you could see things happening. You knew what play was coming. Was there was there a wide receiver that you even knew what was happening? You could have Randy Moss? You could, what was that? Calvin Johnson? Yeah, what were the, some of those moments? No, oh, you just laugh. Because you're like, oh shit, it don't matter. You know, um, man, uh, we played, so here's what's crazy. The year, so like I played Randy when he was in Minnesota. The year he was in New England was the year I got sick, right? So I could I didn't play like the whole half of the season. It was the first trip I traveled to after my surgeries. You know, I thought like they took out my spleen, my gallbladder, like it was a piece of my liver or whatever. So I'm like 160 pounds at this time. I just bought some new clothes so I could like actually travel to the trip. And Troy was hurt too. And if you're a New England fan, I know you remember this. Anthony Smith, who was my replacement, guaranteed that we'd beat the Patriots, right? And this is like the undefeated year when these mugs just showed up and scored points. And bro, I think like that night they scored like 50 something. And it was the first night I was ever happy I was hurt. I was like, hell, I didn't want to be out there for this. <laughs> oh, no. When I see Tom, like I remember the first real conversation we ever had was in my last year, we were practicing with New England and we just talked for like 30 minutes before the preseason game. And I was in Washington at the time, so it was my last year. I called Troy Palomalu afterwards. I was like, bro, I got it. I'm sorry, like, I love him. I was like, I would want him to be my quarterback. I would want to play for and with Tom Brady. When you say that, is that because he was like a nemesis? Like, y'all hated this I dude. wasn't, well, I didn't want to like him, clearly. <laughs> <laughs> like, I wanted to punch his little pretty face with that little pretty cleft Superman chin and all that. Oh, I'm eating avocado ice cream. Look how lean I am now. Do you think Brady will be a good, good analyst? I don't know. I'm gonna be honest. I'll listen to Tom Brady talk about tying his shoes. <laughs> Just to be honest, like Tom's like, yeah, you know, so before the game, I'd always start with the left loop. I'd be like, man, I'm start tying my left loop too. <laughs>I've always respected you and the way that you carried yourself. You know, when I was retiring, I, I was flirting with different ideas of which avenue I wanted to go down. I've always had an interest in media. And, you know, I think what's special about the show is that we can share some of the, the, the trials and tribulations that we had to, to conquer, some of the adversity we had. You have sickle cell anemia, right? Yeah. What, how did that define, you know, who you are as a person, what were some of those challenges? Yeah, so I had a sickle cell trait, mm-hmm. right? I don't have a sickle cell anemia. And so that's why it was so strange for my blood to actually sickle in Denver. It only happens in like less than 1% of the people who have the trait. But like the cool part about it is it didn't kill me. So that helps. <laughs> um, and it, it brought a different awareness to it. Not only in the NFL, but I think in like college, like there's been you know, four or five sickle cell trait related deaths in college training. Um, also, it's, it's a big study in the military as well, because you don't just, like at first it was like, it was kind of like the black disease, Yeah. but like you could be Mediterranean descent. And so like now we're finding out all of these different things and I work with a lot of- symptoms. So it's not, it's not really symptoms, right? So what it is is like your blood, like everybody else's blood is like basically like this, right? When your blood sickles, it's like this. So it's very painful as it travels through your mm-hmm. arteries, your blood vessels or whatever. And so what happened to me was when my blood sickled, I had what's called a spleen infarction. So my spleen died. And then when it died, the pieces of it died, it got infected. So within a month, I went from 205 pounds to 165 pounds. Right, because it was enlarged to like four times its size, so my stomach shrunk. Well, um, I'm assuming in this period of time you have no idea what's going on with you. You don't know what's wrong. Yeah, so like the doctors don't know what's wrong either. Mm. And so like one of the Steelers doctors like read me all my um, 
my like read me all my numbers. vitals and numbers. numbers, and then he like handed me a paper. He's like, okay, I'll listen to you complain now. Almost beat him up, but I realized that you can't like go around punching old doctors in the face. <laughs> um, and so I remember, man, calling uh, Dr. Stanley Marks. He worked at the cancer center in Pittsburgh. He had seen me like four times already, bro. And I called him on a Thursday, like on a Thursday night. And I was like, Doc, I'm so sorry. I was like, I know something's wrong with me, though. I said, I know the tests aren't saying it. I was like, but I was waking up every night with like 103, 104 fever. I was having to change my clothes. My wife was changing the sheets. Like, it was bad. And so he's like, you can hear it in his voice. You know how people get annoyed with you? He's like, all right, man, go ahead, man. Go take a test. <laughs> so I go. We're driving home. He calls my wife, and he's like, uh, he's like, where are your kids? And she was like, uh, they're with my in-laws because my parents had come up. And uh, she was like, don't pack a bag, don't take him home, turn around and go to the hospital. Oh, damn. So he's like, everybody will be outside waiting for you. So like, I pull up, all the people are outside. What's going through your mind at that point? I was like, kind of crunk, because I was like, well. We're going to the, we're gonna get to the bottom of this. Because like, and my biggest thing was, it's like, I know I ain't soft. Like, that was my biggest thing. Like, I had a high pain tolerance. I'd fight through anything. They were basically telling me I should be playing. And I'm like, I'm 165 pounds. Who the hell, I'm a tackle, right? And, ain't, and I was like, ain't no way I lose this much weight in a month and nothing's wrong with me. Like, I couldn't stand up straight. You know what I mean? Like, I couldn't, like, I would try to go to work in the morning and they'd send me home. And so, like, you get there, the infectious disease doctor comes up and she's like this foreign lady. She was super strange. Be there in a second. <laughs> and she was super strange, bro. So I had these bulbs, right? Because they were draining the infection. And she would come in and she would smell them. Right? And she would smell them. She'd be like, oh, that's beautiful. Because, like, she could smell the infection, but they couldn't figure out what the infection was. That's crazy. Right? And so she was so concerned with that. Like, there was one night, bro, my fever got up to, like, 104. Right? So they, like, packed me down with ice and all of this stuff. And so, like, they were still trying to figure out the infection. And it was crazy. My doctor looked like Tom Brady. I called him Dr. Brady. He was the coolest dude ever. I ended up doing, like, golf events with him and everything. And so, uh, and so he comes into the room one day, and I'm like, I'm in the bathroom, and I'm crying. And I was like, bro, like, I was like, I'm done. I was like, I don't want to fight no more. I was like, I'm tired of being sick. You know, I was like, if I'm supposed to die, like, I'm cool. Like, my kids are okay. You know, so, like, I just say this prayer, man. I was just Damn. like, I was like, man, I was like, I asked God, I was like, hey, let my wife find, like, a good man. Oh, damn. You know what I mean? I was like, I don't want him to be more handsome than I am, no. Like, oh, come good on, God. Good but ugly. Well, because I was like, God, I'm already dying. <laughs> like, you can't give her everything. Like, she gonna have the money. Man, I, I couldn't do that. I'd come <laughs> you know back to the ghost. Be like, what do you <laughs> And, uh, like, in January, they tell me that it's like, hey, if you can get healthy enough to play, like, we think you can. And I was like, cool. And so I started training, man. I started working out. You know, I was like, the fact that I'm actually back out there was enough for me. I was like, I never have to win again. I never have to start again. It's like you got you extra know, time. God gave it back to me. So. Amen. When's the last time you had a scrap? Like an actual scrap yeah. or offered somebody one? An actual <laughs> like scrap. Like there's different. Well, like, people have to be willing to fight you, though. Like Cam Newton, like the other yeah, day. Yeah, like, so they were willing to fight Cam, yeah. and then they saw that Cam 6'6", 250. Big boy. And <laughs> you, you better bring your lunch pail, and he ain't like a regular quarterback. He just could throw a football a little bit. Like, that's different. Um, the last time, like, I put myself in a position to have a fight, Super Bowl. This past Super Bowl? Oh, was this to do with you getting robbed? Nah, man. That's a whole other situation. <laughs> Bro, they robbed the piss out of us, too. <laughs> Duh. <laughs> Did it happen after you got robbed that you almost got into this altercation? Same day, actually. The guy that's our camera guy, like, he ain't really got a lot of street knowledge. You know, he don't You're have... You saying he's a chump? You know, just saying common <laughs> sense ain't common. Yeah, he just you know, like that everybody's good in the world. Yeah, <laughs> he is like that type yeah. of dude, though. Like, super nice, super Christian, let's love everybody. That guy. Yeah. And so he sees the dudes fishy and the guys like setting him up, like, hey man, is this the media room? Mother effer, you know there ain't no media room in here. <laughs> but he saw all the cameras, knew all that stuff. So, right, so our guy was like, no, it's not the media room. So he sees him, 
Then he goes bring something upstairs, and like we had to subpoena like the the hotel cameras, everything. Like the detectives work, man, like all day, and got it back. But oh, yeah, they got it back. Yeah, we got it all back. Can, can we get back to who you wanted to fight on that same we don't, day? We, so we don't have to necessarily say who. I say what person, happened. I personally wanted to fight because I don't want to give him any airtime. Yeah. Um, it's you a work certain. With them. It's a certain former football player who works in the media, who has a lot of issues with sort of who I am as a human. Mm -hmm. And it kind of started with like racial things, right? With me like backing black players or 2020 or whatever it is. And he's like, I'm a victim and I use everything as a crutch. And I was like, basically, you know, and I reached out to his partner at the time who I knew. I said, hey, can you give him my phone number? Right, because I like the one thing I won't do, like my big thing is I'm not going to analyze what you analyze or say. That's not my job. I'm not paid to do that. And if I have a problem with you, I'll just try to find you and be like, hey, man, why would you? And I don't care enough to have a problem. You know what I mean? Whatever you say, bro, you could be the worst soccer analyst of all time, but I would never say anything about you doing your job because that's not my job. So I have, a big, I have a big issue when people are like, let's talk about what Ryan said, mm -hmm. right? Because that ain't your job. Um, and so he just kept doing it. And so I, I reached out on Twitter, like publicly, like, hey man, let's just have a conversation, bro. Tell me where you're at, I'll get on the flight. I'll come see you, we'll talk about it. And he was just like, no, I'm a verbal sparrer. I was like, that's stupid. No one verbally <laughs> spars. Like, that's the dumbest thing I've ever heard of. A right? verbal spar. I can see you going yeah. after so like, I don't even know what that so means. Like, I reached out to talk to him, he wouldn't talk to me. So I stopped giving him energy. Mm. And I was like, you're like you're fake. You know what I mean? Because if you truly have this much of an issue with things I say, you should be willing to have a man-to-man -man conversation with me so we can now at least have an understanding of how we're gonna move around one another. Um, and I saw this individual uh, last year at the ESPYs, but we were at like a, we were at a benefit for Stuart Scott. Like I'm not gonna show my ass yeah. at a Stuart Scott event given by my friend Michael Eaves. And like, I have this thing, if I don't say what I need to say, it eats at me. Yeah. Like I can't sleep, I feel like I'm soft, I feel bad, which I'm trying to get over, right? Because I'm a grown adult man. Because you don't say something, that just makes you adult and mature, not soft, but I can't get over it. And so, <laughs> and so like I walked up to him, he was talking to some friends of mine, I tapped him, he turns around, he's like, what's up? And I was like, you fucking shaking your hand? I said, I came up here for a reason. I said, the last time I saw you, you made sure to go on whatever little bitty platform you have and tell people I walked around you. I said, now, so I want everybody to know that this time I walked right up to you. I said, so the next time you do your show, you make sure you tell everybody that's how this situation went down. I said, now, do we have an issue? He ain't had no issue. I ain't got to address it no more because I looked you in the eyes and I saw the bitch in you. Right? So that's, so you, to me Damn. now, to me, you're not a man talking about me. Right? Two things I don't do, right, for sure when it comes to any altercation. I don't beef with women. Right? And I don't punch down. Now, addressing you is punching down to me because I saw your eyes. Like, I know ain't nothing behind them. Mm. Right? So now I know you are just talking about me because talking about yourself Cloud. or being who you are ain't enough for you. Right. So I, wait, I don't follow NFL, but if for anybody out there who does follow NFL, is this obvious? Is it obvious who you're talking they'll about? Know. They'll you know? know. Yeah, they'll know. Don't know. Let me ask one question. All right, go ahead. You've been asking a lot of questions, bro. Uh, what I, I love to... him, <laughs> by the way. You're actually my favorite. Hey, right I appreciate now. you, bro. But I just want to ask who you. Who brought question. you to the show? You. Hey, <clears> for sure. Okay, okay. But I, like growing up, I can tell you weren't afraid of a of a scuffle. But like I seen you on uh, the show with Daniel Cormier and yeah. you doing UFC, I just want to know like were you always a big fan of fighting? Like whether it was like Muay Thai or Jiu Jitsu or striking, yeah. like did you do any of that before you kind of got into talking yeah. about it? Because you seem very knowledgeable on it, and yeah, it's something so, I'm passionate about as well. I just kind of wonder how you got into yeah, it. Yeah. So when I was playing, I trained in Kempo and Jiu Jitsu. Okay. Because you know. Football is not like a fun sport to train for. Like basketball is cool, right? We can go shoot, get up buckets. We can run five on five, three on threes. Football, you just like lift weights and run around. Like that wasn't fun. And so I would try to find things to do from a cardio perspective that wouldn't tax my body as much, but that I enjoyed, 
right? I wanted to trick myself, basically. Like, trick myself into getting my heart rate up, doing something that the was sky's fun. Fitness, kind of. Yeah, you know, and so, you remember back in the day, you could go to Best Buy, and they had the UFC greatest knockout DVDs you can buy. And so, like, I went and bought those, and I was like, man, like, these dudes, is, they don't care. Like, this dude got on shoes, and they kicking each other, right? Like, this guy has on a gi, and he's clearly a heavyweight. This joker right here is wearing underwear, and he 140. Ain't no way they supposed to be fighting, because it was like back in yeah, the day. Yeah, there was not weight classes. There wasn't weight classes. They were just, just fighting. There wasn't rules and all that, right? You had the and so, Gracies, all that. You play football, you consider yourself tough. I ain't that type of tough, yeah, right? Yeah. And so, like, you're watching these people that, to me, are like gladiators. You know, you can wrestle, you can submit, you can strike, but with striking, you can elbow, you can punch, you can kick. And that was fascinating to me because as you watch, like, it go from what was really a tough guy sport to now, like, a true athlete sport. Amen. I know both of y'all can relate on that, but I, I know that I'm also conscious you got hard out. I do. Your manager is staring me down across the camera. <laughs> oh, yeah. So, I... It's 10 o'clock? Oh, yeah, I gotta yeah, go. Yeah, you gotta go. I know. <laughs> just, just real quick, World Cup 2026. We're yes. obviously gonna be there. Yes. If you would like to watch a game with us, we would love to have you. Clint's connected. He can get you the Clint, seats. You gotta get, if Clint, if Clint well, gets me happen. seats, I'll come. Right? Like, so, I, Southern hospitality, I got you. <laughs> yeah, so my big thing is, like, I want to attend events that I never got to attend. Like, I don't love going to football games, but I want, like, I'm gonna try to go to, like, the women's Final Four and do some different things. So, mm -hmm. if the Nations League, March. Yeah, we got you. If the invitation stands, take I would love to come. We'll take him to multiple things. All right, cool. Yeah, well, I can't right, go to cool. multiple things. He's in Dallas. He's from Louisiana. It's close. Oh, it's close? Yeah. Right. OK, so cool. quick flight. Uh, listen, we so appreciate yeah, you appreciate making time it. for us. Thank you, guys. Back you said we had to be here at 7.30. You turned up at 8. We're not going to hold it against that you, That is not true. I got <laughs> here at 7.30. It's kind of true. It's kind of true. Like 7.58. No! <laughs> but we appreciate it. Thank you so much for coming through. Thank you, guys. It was good to meet you. I was not late, by the way, guys. <laughs> My dog. Good Appreciate you, bro. Yes, sir. I was actually here before Clint. <laughs> <laughs>Thank you for watching. If you liked this episode of Kicking It, then don't forget to hit the like button and subscribe to enjoy more raw and unfiltered content from me and the boys.